Hey church, thanks for worshiping with us today. We have so many great ways coming up in the next month to love God, love people, and make disciples. If you're new to Highlands, you're invited to a class we call Discover Highlands on April 28th. You'll tour the campus and learn about our history, beliefs, priorities, and mission. You'll also meet the pastors and ministry leaders, and you'll learn how you can get connected in the church family. It includes lunch, and there's programming for kids, too. Guys, our men's retreat is coming up April 19th through the 21st at Lost Canyon up in Williams. It's a weekend of fun and encouragement with free time activities like golf, hiking, paintball, and more. You'll open up God's word and learn to elevate your faith, relationships, and purpose by following the example of Jesus. And finally, Highland's own Shine Theater Company is bringing the hills alive with the sound of music from April 19th to the 21st. Our talented cast brings Maria and the Von Trapp family to life as they learn about life, family, and overcoming the biggest of obstacles. This is a perfect opportunity to reach out to our community with a production for all ages, so invite some friends. Tickets are available online. Details about all of these things and more are on our website at highlandschurch.org and in our smartphone app. And if you're with us in person today, stop by Info Central in the lobby. We'd love to meet you. Well, good morning, church. We're so glad that you're here. We invite you to stand and join us as we worship our great God. Thankful for his word that lights our path all his wisdom and all his love and care let's sing it together Oh, yeah. 
Well, church, it is great to be together with you, worshiping our great God. You can go ahead and have a seat, and I want to say welcome to Highlands. We are so glad that you're here on this beautiful Sunday morning. If you're watching us online, a welcome to you as well. And hey, if you are new to Highlands, we want to give you a special welcome. We're so glad that you're joining us, that you've chosen to worship and check this place out, and we would love to connect with you. There are a couple easy ways that you can do that. Uh, you can text us, text the word Highlands to the number 94,000. We'll hit you right back with a text with a number of ways that you can connect or even just submit a prayer request. If there's a way we can pray for you, we'd love to connect that way. If you're here in the room, there's uh, connect cards in the seat backs in front of you. You can fill out whatever information that you would like to share on that card. And then after the service, if you're in a hurry, you can drop it in a giving box on the uh, either side of the exit doors on your way out. But the better place to take that card, honestly, is Info Central, right in the center of the lobby. Our welcome team is there. They'd love to answer questions that you might have. They tell you about the church. Uh, really, any direction they can point you in, if you're new to Highlands, they'd love to share info. And really, not if you're you don't have to be new to Highlands either. Anything that you want to find out about to get connected, Info Central is your spot. We would like to point you in that right direction. Our mission is simple. Love God, love people, make disciples. We want to equip the church to follow Jesus wherever you are at in your faith. We're excited about all the ways we have to do that in the coming month. Uh, April doesn't slow down at all. We've got so many great ways to be able to do that. Now, you might be wondering, church, um, our stage setup is a little bit different this week, and you're like, what's going on with that? Well, a lot of you might know, but some of you might not. We have a community theater program right here at Highlands called Shine Theater Company. And Shine, yeah, there's a Shine fan. Shine Theater Company. Why do we have a theater company, community theater company here at a church? Well, we want to be able to connect with our community. We want our community to know that we're here for them, that we love them. We want to provide something that's kid-focused for families where they can come, have an incredible experience that they can get to know us. We can invite them back into our church family. We can invite them to church. We can share the gospel with them. And a community theater program is a great way to do that, especially as so many schools are getting rid of that type of thing. So Shine Theater's been going for a couple of years now. Sound of Music is what they're going to be performing next weekend, April 19th through 21st. And so this is sort of our digital set that allows us, if I want to transport us into 1930s Austria, I can do it just like this, right? There it is. We're at the base of the Swiss Alps. The birds are chirping. It's a beautiful lake. Uh, you can almost hear Maria running down that mountain singing the hills are alive. That's what we are looking forward to. And church, we'd invite you. Come and invite people. This is the easiest invite ever. If you've got somebody who's like, man, I don't know. I don't know about coming to a church service. Say, that's all right. Come to the sound of music at my church. You're going to enjoy it. It's going to be a great experience. And then invite them back to church after that. It's a great opportunity. Details are at Info Central. We'd encourage you to do that. We're excited about what God is going to do this morning as we worship him. We're going to worship in song. We're going to pray together. We worship God through our giving. There's giving envelopes in the seat backs in front of you that explain how you can give here at Highlands. We're going to worship God by the study of his word. We just got done singing. Take you at your word. We believe the word of God is the final authority for all of faith and life. And so we're going to die into the Gospel of Luke this morning to hear from the teachings of Jesus, and we're excited to do that. And another part of our worship is just being a family and encouraging one another as we gather. So before we sing again, would you just stand up right where you're at and say hi to the people around you? Go ahead. church let's continue singing together our world has a lot it offers but nothing is better than the love of our god let's sing together i search the world it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade i never
Creation cries, oh. 
Well, church, last week we taught you a new song. It's called Same God, and it traces God's incredible faithfulness throughout all generations, throughout God's word, throughout all of history. And it also talks about our incredible need for God every minute, every hour of every day. Let's sing together. I'm calling on the God of Jacob Whose love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses The one who opened up the Now declare this with your whole heart. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. Shepherd boy courageous I may not face Goliath But I've got my own giants Oh God, my God, I need you Oh God, my God, I need you now How I need you now Oh, oh rock, oh rock of ages I'm standing I'm standing, never changes. You heard your children then, you hear your children now. You are the same God, you are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God, you are the same God, you were provided then, you are providing now, you are the same God, you are the same.
hearts right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You touch the lepers then. I feel your touch right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. church. Father, we are in awe of your faithfulness to us. Father, as we've sung, you're the only one worthy, the only one holy. And so we look to you for everything. Kind of the times where we think we know it all, can do it all, where the things we have belong to us, would you remind us quickly that God, we need you. Father, this church family is here carrying a variety of burdens, anxieties, worries, things that are top of mind. Father, would you help us to turn to you and turn to you first with all of those things, whether people are seeking wisdom or healing or restoration of relationships. Father, would you do the work that only you can do as we humbly submit ourselves to your will, your way, your word, Father, for all things. God, as we look at our world that is so lost and broken, we see conflict rising up again in places like the Middle East. Father, we turn to you and say, God, only you can make a way. And so, Father, we pray. We pray for peace. We pray that your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. Father, your kingdom that is marked by peace and love and restoration. Father, it's only possible through you and only possible through the work that you did through your son on the cross. And so, Father, we remember that we ourselves were lost and far away until you sent your son to restore our relationship between us and you. We thank you for that gift of grace. And now, Father, would you help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, your word, and what you have to speak to us even now as we open up your word to study it together as an act of worship of you as we continue on together as a church family. We thank you for what you're doing in us and through us. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, you can go ahead and have a seat. How's everybody doing? Good morning. Good morning. Quick, quick uh, uh, follow-up announcement to all the men in the room. I don't know if you caught it earlier, but our men's retreat is taking off uh, next weekend. A group of our men going to go up north to uh, worship the Lord together, to study God's word together. And my encouragement to all of us as men would be this. Do anything you can to be there. Uh, the worship will be great, the teaching will be great, all of that will be great, but what is even greater for us as a church family is the brotherhood that takes place on weekends like this. Uh, you will go, and for many of us, certainly as men, at least, at least this man, we spend a lot of our lives kind of in isolation. I got it all figured out, I don't need any help, uh, but that's just a lie of the enemy. God never intended us to live life in isolation. God wants us locking arms with each other, and so that's what men's retreat does. It gives us an opportunity to become brothers in a real powerful way. Here's the reality for a lot of us. Uh, even hearing it now, we're, we, we flash back to junior high. Uh, I don't know anybody. Who am I going to sit with at lunch? And it's all fearful. And I get it. That is real. Own that. And that what the drive up will feel like. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? The drive back down the hill will be far different. 
You will come back down the mountain realizing you are not in this alone, that you've got men that are a couple of steps ahead of you in your faith and a couple of steps behind you in their faith that you can both help encourage and bring along, but you can also look to to be an arm to grab you, to pull you up as well. That's what happens on weekends like next weekend. And so if you are here as a man and you desire to look for that sort of relationship, we would encourage you to go. And I'm going to tell you right now, uh, when God fills a church full of men that love him and love their families and love their wives well, we are on the cusp of something incredible. And so that's why it's so important for us as a church, as you men, if you want to think and pray that through, we'd love to have you go on that. Um, we'll transition now to our, our time in the word. And uh, I do want to throw Thomas under the bus. Thomas is one of my really good friends. Love Thomas to death. I don't have anything ever negative to say about Thomas other than the fact that last week he got to preach the prodigal sons which is the top two of parables that every pastor wants to preach. I get Luke 16, 1 through 18, which is in the bottom 1,000 of parables that any pastor wants to preach, only because every commentator I looked at, every seminary professor I spoke with, every theologian out there reads these, this parable and goes, you know, maybe this, it could be that. It's a mystery. It's a weird parable. There's not a single hero in the entire thing. We got a, a rich, man, rich master, we got a corrupt manager, we got, we got debtors that are doing some shady things, and all throughout it, a man is commended for his shrewdness. Not a, not a uh, I don't find that in the gifts and the fruit of the Holy Spirit, shrewdness. And yet that's what's commended here. And so there's a lot going on as we lean into this today, but let me set it up for you first by kind of sharing you at least a, a personal testimony from my own life. Uh, I got married when I was 20 years old. My wife was 19. Everyone that had counsel in our life told us, this is a bad idea. You should not do this. You're too young. There's too much ahead of you. It's going to be incredibly difficult. You should not get married. You should wait a few more years before you make that step. But we were in love. So we made that step. And what those dialogues meant to me as someone that listened to the counsel, though I didn't heed it, I at least listened to it, what it created in me was an insecurity. I would say an unhealthy insecurity to the point where my greatest core terror for most of my adult life has been not being able to provide for my family. And it freaks me out. I mean, I'm checking, for there was a season, I was checking my bank account hour by hour. And like, we, stuff would come in, it would just, oh, I was, oh it was terrible. And once we'd finally get, a, I'd work hard and we'd get a little bit of money, we'd have a little cushion, and be like, oh, God, thank you. We were in a good spot. Something stupid would happen. Root canal, $900. Oh, pull the tooth. I don't care. <laughs> Flat tire, water pump on a car, that $900. And it just every time we'd get ahead, God would just take it away. And I just spent 20 plus years of my life just in a whirlwind of fear and anxiety around money. Week after the day, you know, we did Easter a couple of weeks ago. Uh, beautiful day here. Everything was great. It was raining a lot, though. But then on Monday, I'm here at the office. It was closed, but I was trying to get a couple of things done. Brooke calls me. Hey, there's water in the garage. Oh, it's probably just from the rain. So she sweeps it out. About two hours later, calls me back. Hey, there's more water in the garage. All right, I'll be right home. Sure enough, get home, take a look. She wasn't lying. Water coming out of the water heater. Oh, perfect. Call up a really good friend of mine. Hey, our water heater went out. Somehow, in God's perfect timing, he was able to get to it a couple of days later. Puts in a brand new water heater. We don't get a bill. I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Next day, get the invoice. $1,300. $1,300 bill, Kevin Yule, the majority of my life, would have caused instant dry heaving and potential vomit. <laughs> oh, for whatever reason, this time, literally, I don't know if it's because what we've just been walking through as a family, but literally, I remember just sitting there going, you know, God, this is, it's all stuff. It's just your stuff. It's your stuff. Paid that bill, didn't give it a second thought. For me, I was like, yeah, this is one of the first times where something has rocked my world, put me out of control, but I just been able to go, ah, you know what, God, don't worry about it. I kid you not. One week from the day we paid that bill, I'm driving my kids to school, 7.30 in the morning, Brooke calls. Hey, just got the mail. Okay. Do you remember the company we sold our house with six years ago? No idea. Was it this company? Sure. I have no idea. Well, we just got a check in the mail. Apparently, there's a class action lawsuit that this company did something somewhat nefarious, and uh, they had to settle with all their clients. I said, well, how much is it for? I'm thinking it's like 20 bucks. Hey, we'll go get some ice cream. 
It's for $1,330.31. And I go, babe, you got to be kidding me. Yeah, so praise God, God's glory, God's goodness. But he, I, trust me, guys, I'm no name it and claim it guy, so let's not go down that road. But here's what I'll tell you what I've learned in the last 14 days is that God's done a great work in my life. Because my anxiety and my fear over control of money and everything, I would say if you were to ask me, I worshiped money. Not because I had a lot, but because I didn't have enough. And it became something that controlled a lot of my mind and a lot of my thoughts. And though maybe the last 14 days I've made a big step in fixing my eyes on the Lord and going, God, it's just yours. I'm terrified that I'm going to go right back to that place if I'm not careful. And so Jesus is going to give us through a very difficult parable today a statement, and some of you guys have heard it before. It's not an often put on a coffee mug, but it is a verse that most of us know. And he's going to put us in a position where we've got to ask ourselves a question. Because Jesus is going to look at his disciples and say, Men, you cannot serve God and money. You can't. You can serve one or the other, but you can't have both. And so the question that we've got to wrestle with before we even dive into our time in the Word today, hopefully with just a heart posture before him, is to say this, God, God, would you search me? Would you know me? Would I kind of just lay my spirit before you? And would you reveal to me, who am I worshiping? Am I worshiping my stuff and my money? Or am I worshiping God? And that's going to become a theme that's going to run throughout our time in the Word today. But that is something, I tell you this, I'm not going to tell you what to do. That's not my job. It's the Holy Spirit's job. What our job as God's sons and daughters is to posture ourselves in such a way that we would say, God, would you do what only you can do? And does that reveal in my heart those things that I need to course correct on? And so that's going to be my prayer now. As I get ready to dive into the word, I'm going to pray that for myself and for all of you that are willing to join me in this adventure. Let me pray. God, thank you. Uh, as I've been telling you a bunch, God, thank you for your patience with me. God, 20 plus years, I had my eyes fixed on things that I felt like I could control. God, I worship the wrong thing. God, I thank you for your patience with me in that. And God, you know my heart, even right now. God, the fear and the angst that grips me to think I might shift back into that way of thinking in the years to come. God, I pray that you would keep me with my eyes fixed on you. And God, I pray even now as we lean into your word today that you would convict my heart. Show me those things that I need to surrender to you. And God, I pray the same for all of my brothers and sisters here today. And God, as I prayed earlier, I will pray again. I pray the enemy would not have a foothold in this place, that not one ounce of shame would come out of anything we look at today, but God, that you would not relent for one second from pressing in through the power of your Holy Spirit and convicting our hearts on those things we need to surrender to you. So God, start with me. Let this be an opportunity for me to surrender everything to you. We love you, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So here we go. Luke chapter 16, verse 1. Let me set it up for you real quick. Like I said, commentators, theologians all over the map on this one. Uh, let me give you the, the broad principle of what I think Jesus is attempting to do, certainly as we, we walk our way all the way through his interaction with the Pharisees after the parable. I think Jesus is looking at his disciples and he's saying, men, now is the time to invest not in the here and now, but into eternity. To have your eyes fixed on this place is temporal and we're to use everything we can for God's kingdom now, but there's a future kingdom coming and we're gonna live life for eternity in mind, not for the temporal in mind. And I think that's the question that some of us need to wrestle with when it comes to who am I worshiping? Am I using my stuff to build my kingdom or am I using my stuff to build God's kingdom? And so that's where I think he's going. He'll start it off this way. He says to his disciples, important to know the audience, this is not for the Pharisees, this is for his men, to his disciples. There was a rich man, later going to be called the master, who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that, his, that this man was wasting his possessions. Keep that, frame, that, that term in mind, wasting his possessions. And so he calls him in and he says to him, what is this I hear about you? Turn in your accounts of your management for you can no longer be a manager. And the manager says to himself, what am I going to do since my master is taking away the management from me? I'm, too, I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. Verse 4, I've decided what to do. Uh, verse 4, then I have decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first one, hey, how much do you owe my master? He said quickly, uh, I owe 100 measures of oil. He says to him, take your bill 
sit down quickly and write down 50. Then he says to another, how much do you owe? He says, I, I owe 100 measures of wheat. Take the bill, write down 80. Cook in the books. This is where it gets weird. Verse 8, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. Hey, you just robbed me of what I, if I'm doing the math, a bunch of wheat and some oil. Good job. Seems strange. Why would anyone get commanded for doing something dishonest or commended for doing anything dishonest? For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Verse 9, strangeness continues. And I tell you, disciples, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. Lots going on here. Let me unpack it as best as I've been able to understand it. First, let's go back. Rich man gives his, gives his stuff to a manager to take care of. Basically, an investment manager. Manage my stuff. Manager is not doing a good job, so the master tells him, I'm going to hold you accountable. I think that's the first thing we need to understand here today. We're going to get to it in just a little bit, but Jesus is going to say, everything that we have is God's. God has entrusted it to us. And the day's going to come when we're going to give an account for what we have done with God's stuff. 2 Corinthians 5.10, right? We will all kneel before the throne of God and give an account for everything that we've done. The righteous things and the evil things. The good and the bad. Though our salvation is secure in Jesus Christ, at no point at the end of that is God going to go, man, you did a lot of bad stuff. You're out. No, you have the blood of Jesus covering you. You're, you're in. But we are going to give an account for what we did here and now. So the first thing this manager hears is accountability is coming. And I haven't been necessarily stewarding what God entrusted to me real well, but now he hears accountability is coming, and so he's got an opportunity to prepare for his future, to alter his course. And he does it through some pretty sketchy ways in writing these things off. But I do think there's a charge here for Jesus to say to his disciples, guys, you're going to be held accountable. So change what you're doing now to prepare for your future, and then you're going to hear in just a little bit our preparedness now, what we do with what God's entrusted to us now, I do believe is going to have a huge impact on eternity, on the rewards that we will receive on into eternity. It's what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 6 all throughout. When you pray, don't pray so others see you. Pray in secret so that your Father in heaven will reward you. Store up for yourselves in heaven where moth and, and rust don't steal or don't kill and destroy, but they are eternal treasures. And I think that's what Jesus is referencing here. Accountability is coming. We need to understand that. And everything that we've been given, God has entrusted to us to manage it well. And the day's gonna come where he's gonna look and we're gonna give an account for what we did with God's stuff. Let me get to verse nine. So I tell you, Make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth. Let me just stop right there. I don't think God is saying money in itself is unrighteous. It's not, it's, money is not wicked. I think what Jesus is saying here is saying, men, to his disciples, guys, I need you to understand, we're working on a different economy. Anything in this world, anything in this world is unrighteous in comparison to eternity. Anything that, I mean, you can have the, this is the greatest, oh, you can build the greatest kingdom in the world here. And when God comes back or God calls you home, you're leaving it here. And what waits for us in eternity is going to be far better than anything this world has to offer. So Jesus says, look, make friends of yourselves with the stuff I've been giving you. It's unrighteous wealth, though. Call it what it is. The real word is mammon. It just refers to all of your stuff. It's all unrighteous in comparison to eternity and the holiness of God. So he says to his disciples, look, make friends for yourselves. Take what God has entrusted to you and use it to be a blessing to others. But yet when it fails, you see that right there in the next part? So that when it fails, no matter what the enemy has convinced us of, all of our stuff, all the things that we fill our life with to bring us comfort and joy and all these things, it's going to fail. It just will. Anybody have the original iPhone still in their pocket? No, you got the iPhone 39. Guess what? iPhone 44 is coming. Like, it's just, it's inevitable. The stuff we have, it wears out. It was never meant to last forever because this world was never meant to last forever. It's all temporary, but eternity's coming where it will not end. Where are we storing up our treasures? Use what God has entrusted to you now to be a blessing to others, and yet when it all fails and when God calls you home or comes back for you, what? They 
may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Here's our next question we've got to wrestle with. Who's the they? Who's the they? The they could be the friends, those that you've used your wealth to be a blessing to. Maybe it's the poor, some allusion to almsgiving here. You use your wealth to bless the poor, and then when you get to heaven, they're going to go, man, you have no idea what that five bucks or that five million, whatever it is you gave, had an impact on my life. Thank you. And you might be welcomed into eternity by those people that you've used your wealth to be a blessing to. Maybe. I tend to be more on the other side where the they, I think, is this idea of future rewards. You use your stuff now to be a blessing to God's kingdom, and when you enter into eternity, your rewards, they will be there to greet you, that you will then to get to enjoy on into eternity. I think he's going to allude to it, certainly when we get down to verse 11, where he talks about this idea of true riches. Not this temporal stuff, but true riches. I put some additional reading in your notes there. Go read 1 Corinthians 3. Go read 2 John 8. I mean, there's a lot of passages that Jesus and his disciples talk about, this idea of future reward. So maybe what God is saying is, look, if you're a good steward with what I give you now, I hope you'll be a great steward with what I give you on into eternity. And maybe that's where he's going to go next when we get to verse 10. He says this, one who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then, if, implies doubt, if then, You have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth. Again, same phrase, same word. I think it's just talking about the things of this world. If you've been unfaithful with the the temporary things of this world, who will entrust you to the true riches? Here's what I think Jesus is saying to his disciples. Guys, God's given you stuff. He's given you stuff that was never meant to last. In fact, I'm telling you, it's going to fail, but he's given it to you to steward well, to build his kingdom. And if you can be faithful in this temporary stuff, man, let me just tell you what awaits you in eternity where my Father will put you faithful over much on into eternity. But on the dark side of that coin, if you can't even be trusted with the stuff here and now, the temporary stuff, the things God's given you now in a life that is here today and gone tomorrow, if you're not faithful in that, do you think he's really going to reward you and put you over great things into the kingdom? I think the implied answer is no. Faithful in little, whatever God's entrusted to us now, faithful in much later. Verse, uh, let's go to verse 13. No, let's go to verse 12. And if, sorry, I skipped that one. And if you have not been faithful, here it is, in that which is another's. If you have not been faithful in that which was another's. Let's go back up to verse uh, 1. What was, the, what was the manager accused of doing? Wasting his master's possessions. Maybe there's an illusion here where Jesus is saying, look, if you can't even be trusted with God's possessions here and now, if you can't be trusted with that, who will give you that which is your own? Again, I think there's a tie-in here. Then we get to verse 13. We've already referenced it already. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. You can't. You got to pick. So then the question is, who do you serve? What are you serving? Let me ask some questions around that. I'm not going to decide this for you, but let me just give you some things from my own life. I told you a little bit earlier, anxiety over money, never feeling like I have enough to be in control, never feeling like I've had enough to ward off all the insecurity that's out there, all the people that looked at me at 20 years old and said, you're going to fail. This is never going to work. And so all of that forever, for the last 24 plus years, has been inside of me to where I'm just, I just got to get a little bit more and a little bit more so that everything will be okay. That is me essentially saying, God, I don't trust you. I'm going to do it for myself, and I'm going to serve this because it occupies my mind and my time and my thoughts, and it spins me out of control when I feel like I'm not in control. I'm worshiping the wrong thing. I'm serving the wrong thing. Maybe that's it for you. Maybe it's anxiety stuff. Maybe it's different. This has never been my thing, though it could very easily be my thing, maybe if, if I let my guard down. But maybe you are the one that just, you look around and you want what everyone else has got. You're never quite satisfied with what you have. There's always a longing for, man, if I could just have that. If I could just get that. And so we live in one of the most beautiful cities in all of America, and everyone's got all this stuff, and we drive around and we just go, man, oh, what it would it be like? 
Why am I not? Why do they? Why not me? And all of that, you can go back to the Old Testament. That's an idea of covetedness. We're coveting, longing for other things. Maybe we get jealous because we don't have what others have and we want it so bad. That is all under the umbrella of worshiping stuff, serving stuff. Maybe we fall victim to the other one, and this is the one, again, where I still wrestle with. We, we've lost sight of the fact that everything we have is God's. We like to convince ourselves that it's ours, but it's all God's. My kids will say to me, hey, Dad, can you move your car? Why? Because it's my car. It's a real nice 2011 Toyota Camry. Salvage title. Top notch. If you want it, you can have it. <laughs> but you know what it is? It's my car. No, it's not. It's God's car. He's given it to me and entrusted it to me to steward well. I pull up to the light at Pinnacle Peak in Pima often, driving into work. Sweet red sports car rolls up next to me. There's a lot of days where I drive from that light into the parking lot going, God, what would it be like to have that? I could do a lot of damage on the 101 in that thing. <laughs> and then I could sell that car and pay off my house and buy six other houses if you would let me, right? I mean, no, mine just goes. All of that is me going, oh, God, what could be in temporary stuff? Temporary stuff. I'm reminded, God, you've entrusted whatever you've entrusted to me, whether it's millions of dollars or it's two nickels, you've entrusted it to me, and I need to steward it well because the day's coming where I will look God in the eye and he's gonna go, what'd you do with the stuff I gave you? Did you invest in your kingdom or did you invest in my kingdom? And man, to the disciples and to all of us in here as sons and daughters of God, I think that's a question we gotta wrestle with. Whose kingdom are we investing in? God's kingdom or our kingdom? God's kingdom or our kingdom? Now, let's keep going. Can't serve both. You gotta pick one and you need to figure out through the power of the Holy Spirit where you're at. Verse 14, the Pharisees, they were hanging around listening to all of this still. Though the message wasn't directed to them, they certainly heard it. And Luke Loves to throw them under the bus whenever he can. Verse 14, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, in case there was a doubt, these warning shots Jesus was throwing to his disciples landed squarely in the laps of the Pharisees. They heard all of these things. And they, like some of us, even sometimes in my own life, instead of falling under the conviction of it and going, God, that's, that's me, I need to change. Instead, they threw rocks at the messenger. Wait, you're talking about us. We don't like that. Ridicule Jesus. So what does Jesus say in verse 15? So he says to them, you are those. You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. He's gonna go on and talk about this in just a second, but let me pull that. You are those who justify yourselves before men. What was that about? Well, here's what was going on. Pharisees long ago had learned they could write religious law, including laws that demanded certain taxes and tributes, that they could write those in and people would pay them. And though everyone maybe might have known, like, well, this doesn't quite seem right, but I guess it's just, I mean, they're in charge. It is what it is. So they just did it. They were extorting money from people under a common understanding, like, well, it just is what it is. Nothing we can do about it. And Jesus says, look, just because everyone else has bought into this and said, eh, it just is what it is, doesn't mean it's okay. Because God's not saying, what are you doing? God's looking at your, what does it say here? God knows your hearts. God knows your hearts. Two sides to this coin that we both got to play out. One is this. God knows your heart. God knows your heart. If there's anything going on in this world that you would say, well, man, society just accepts it. It's not that big of a deal, but there's angst in your soul, in your spirit, conviction around you. You need to lean into that and trust that that's the Lord's doing. Because just because it's lawful, says Paul, doesn't mean it's profitable. Just because it's legal doesn't mean we should. I'm having this dialogue with a couple of my friends on the weed front right now, right? Arizona legalized weed. A lot of people smoking weed. It's legal. This is great. Sure, it's legal. Is it right? That's for you to discern. But just because man's law says it is, we've got to hold everything up to God's law. That's where Jesus is going to go next. But he's looking at these, uh, these Pharisees and going, hey, just because everyone else is okay with this doesn't mean God's okay with it because God cares about your heart. Here's the other side of that coin. If you leave here today, and you would all think, oh, that little punk, he just made me feel guilty. So here, I'm going to write a check to the church. Here's your money. Take it, God. Let me tell you right now, keep your check. Keep your money. We don't need it. Nor does God. God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He's always going to take care of his church. God doesn't want your stuff. God wants your heart. 
God wants a heart posture that you would say, you know what, God? I want to give this to you because I want to worship you and you only. Not because I have to, not out of obligation, but because your heart is in line with what God is calling you to do. That's why you got to figure out what's God asking of you. What's the Holy Spirit putting on your heart in the midst of all of this? But don't think for a second that God's going, okay, here, here let me see your spreadsheet. Okay, did you give 10% on the... Okay, you're good. You paid your bill. No, there's no bill to pay. There's just this humble posture before the Lord saying, God, it's all your stuff. And I want to steward it for your kingdom and for your glory. So would you show me what that looks like? And then stepping out in faith in that and going, God, I'm going to do what you have asked of me. To me, that's where the reward comes. Because God knows your heart. It's not a posture of the what, it's a posture of the why. Verse 16. The law and the prophets, they were written until John. This is a reference, I believe, to John the Baptist, who came and prepared way the straight for the Lord, and all of a sudden ushered in this new eternity kingdom-minded gospel. The law and the prophets, we had those until John, since the good news of the kingdom of God is preached through Jesus and on into Paul and all the rest of the disciples and everyone who forces his way into it. But just in case they missed it, but it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Just because we are in an age of grace, just because Jesus has paid our our sins on the cross, just because we are on this side of a new covenant does not mean that God's moral law that he put down through the pages of scripture do not still apply to us. And the day that we begin to abuse God's grace and go, I'm covered by the blood of Jesus so I can do whatever I want, just be careful. God's still holding us to this. Let's get real in the weeds given what tomorrow is, April 15th, tax day. Talking about money, there are a litany of things that you could do to fudge the numbers. And you could probably do them under man's law and be okay with it. No one's going to say anything. God knows your heart. What would it look like to humbly submit and say, God, I don't know what you want to do, but I want to be as above reproach as possible in everything that I do. Opportunity. We're going to give an account. And this is the dialogue I've had in my head multiple times. Because you, you guys ever do TurboTax? It's of the devil, I think, sometimes. Because, like, <laughs> it's got this little, here's what your refund is, or here's what you'll owe. And you can, like, put different numbers in, and that number changes a lot. <laughs> so I just messed with my head. Oh, wait, what if I, maybe I did, let's add an extra comma here. Oh, wow, look at that. <laughs> and so I've had this dialogue in my brain as we've gone through some of that stuff. And then I come back to, well, Kevin, is the couple hundred bucks you're going to squeeze out now? really worth what you know in your heart is right for eternity? And so just, that's just my own conviction as I sit there. And I'm, God, I'm not going to lie to you. It's a struggle sometimes. What I want to do, everything I can to live according to the word of God, not according to the word or the law of man. Now, five minutes left. Just in case today wasn't awkward enough. Here we go, verse 18. <laughs> Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Let's pray. (laughs) Okay, here's the thing. Uh, I do not, I do not have the time to lean into the theology around divorce and remarriage today. Uh, And we are very well aware of that. Uh, we are going to have a viewpoint on May 5th, on a Sunday morning, both hours, over in our high school room, where we're going to walk through Highlands Church theological position around divorce and remarriage. And when I say it's Highlands Church's position, I believe, because I've been a part of it and we've worked on it a bunch, it is, it is the best we can do to make sense of God's position on divorce and remarriage from start to finish. So if you have questions around that and want to know where we as a church stand and really where we feel like God's word leans, come to that on May 5th. For the sake of today, let me tell you why this is in here. What did Jesus just get done saying? Not one single law from God's law is going to fall away. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of his law to go away. So then he uses marriage as an example. Because what did the Pharisees do? Again, the Pharisees were kings of taking what God wrote down and then adjusting it to say whatever whatever they wanted it to say. So much so that they had gotten to the place where they written in, it's okay to divorce your wife for a whole list of things. The most menial thing in the world being, if your wife burns your dinner and you're not happy, you can divorce her. And that's what they were doing. Ah, I'm not happy with you anymore. I'm going to upgrade over here. So you're done. You're out. Moving on. 
all under the law of this is totally practiced under God's umbrella of, of covenant. It's not. Go back and do your history. Go back to, to Deuteronomy and Exodus. God allowed Moses to write a certificate of divorce to protect women. God didn't want it, but in an effort to protect women, men were doing sinful things, stupid things, and going, yeah, I'm done with you. And these women, because of society at that time, had no other option, no one to provide for them. And if they couldn't get remarried, they would basically just have to beg their entire life. So God says, no, grant them a certificate of divorce, severing that relationship so they are free to get remarried as an act of love and compassion towards women, towards these wives, for the sinfulness of man. These guys had completely cannibalized it to make it something totally unhealthy, un I mean, just wicked and evil. And so Jesus says, hey, look, just because this gospel of grace has come in, don't think for a second that any bit of my moral law does not continue. And let me just call one out maybe as I'm in this midst of Pharisees. Let's start with maybe divorce and remarriage. In case they weren't convicted enough around the money, he brings it back to this. So what do we do with all of this? Well, I think, again, the, the thing that I've been wrestling with is whose kingdom I am I investing in? God's entrusted all of this stuff to me. It's God's stuff. It's God's stuff. From my money to my home to my cars to my gifts that he's given me. Go read First Peter, right? God has given us spiritual gifts that he wants us to steward well. All of it, God's going to look at me someday and go, Kevin, you're my son. And you are saved for all eternity because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But let's, let's walk through some choices and decisions you've made throughout your life. And we'll be held accountable. So today is the day maybe that we stop and we just say, all right, God, let me just take inventory of my life. Let me just do a little accounting of my life. Who am I serving? Are we serving God or are we serving our stuff? Are we serving God or are we serving our stuff? Have we worked so hard to build our kingdom that at times we go, man, God, I hope, I, don't, I hope you never come back because this is so good. Let me tell you, that's a dangerous place to live. Let's keep our eyes fixed on eternity. I'm gonna pray for us and then we're gonna close our time in a song that's gonna talk a lot about what it looks like to surrender and even surrendering in this place at this moment. Let me pray. God, you know, uh, well, God, you know the hearts of every human being in this room. And you know what you're up to in the lives of each and every one of them. God, I pray for myself. God, that you would give me the courage. God, you'd give me the, uh, well, even God, the conviction to listen to what it is you're saying. To not shrink back from what is of you. And God, if there is anything and continues to be things that you bring to mind, God, that I would leave them in this place, that I would surrender them to you and that I would fix my eyes on you and you only that I would be a servant that serves you and you only. And God, I pray you would guard my heart from all of the things Satan would love to throw at me to get my eyes off of you and onto stuff, things that are so temporal. God, I pray the same for every brother and sister here. Whatever you're stirring in their heart and their soul right now, God, would you let them lean into it? Would you let them just have a posture before you, God, that they would give you all the freedom in the world to convict where you need to convict. And God, as we prayed earlier, I pray that not one ounce of shame would come from the enemy in this place. God, you would chase after our hearts. You would change us from the inside. And God, that you would get all the glory for what you're doing, not only in us, but through us. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Kevin. As Kevin said, we would like to respond in a song of worship together, a song of surrender. Would you stand and join us as we sing?
is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing now. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Amen. Let me retell you the words you just got done singing. This is where I lay it down. This is my surrender. I want to make room for the Lord to do his best work. Maybe that's what God's stirring in your heart today, that today is the day that you say, all right, God, here it is. You've entrusted this stuff to me. How do you want me to use it? And today would be a day of surrender for you. We've got a bunch of people up front that would love to pray with you walk through that with you. We also have an incredible group of men and women that have gone through a lot of training for a, lot, a number of months called our Stevens Ministers that are here just to be a shoulder to lean on, an ear to listen, to come alongside, to love, encourage, and support you in that. We have a lot of different care opportunities out here as a church because all we want to do is come alongside each other as a family because this is not easy stuff. And everything we're about to hear the second we walk out of those doors is absolutely counter to a lot of what's found in the pages of Scripture. And so our best effort to lean on each other, to lock arms with each other, and to do this life together. It's our best chance of being the men and women God's called us to be as his church. So I'd encourage you, take advantage of some of these things. But also you guys need to know that we're a family together. We're a body of Christ together. And that starts the second that I say, see you next weekend, that we have a chance to love and care for each other. So love each other. Service is never over until you love each other in this place. Great way to love each other, go hit up the barbecue outside. I know the Masters is on, but that's what DVRs are for. Fast forward to five commercials they give you. You don't need another watch or a financial company anyway. Okay, so go eat. Be a family together. Enjoy some food together. Laugh. Have fun. Let your kids have a good time together. Be a family. We love you guys. We'll see you guys all next weekend.